<laughs> Welcome to my wow chats, words of wisdom with people I admire, respect, and whose work is in line with making this world a better place. <laughs> and I have Bronnie Lennox Thompson. Nice. Thank you so much. Oh, so good to have you. So we're here at the San Diego Pain Summit, and I just did a two-day course with Bronnie. You taught um, acceptance, commitment therapy, Mm -hmm. uh, for people in pain. Yes. It was wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Bronnie's an OT. Wonderful. So you're you're an OT. Um, you have a PhD in yep. like what's your health sciences? So it was um, looking at people who live well with pain because I thought we learn a lot about people who don't manage, mm. but we know not very much about how people live well with pain. How do they get to that point and um, I think if we learn from people who live well, we might be able to pick up on some ideas about what worked for them and then apply that to other people mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So I know, you know, it's probably hard to recap, you know, all of your research and just a mm -hmm. loud chat, but for people listening, whether it's someone in pain or uh, someone who lives with someone in pain or mm -hmm. loves someone in pain or a, a, maybe a healthcare provider, um, from your research like what did you find was there like one key sort of message mm -hmm. that people who do live well with pain that you could mm -hmm. share with us or there are, there are three things yeah oh, it's, okay. it's a process okay so so the first thing that I, I think is important is to know that there's not it's didn't seem to me to be oh this person's got the magic ingredient that I mean they manage really well really well it's a process so, so most people at the beginning of having their pain find that this huge disruption just changes their thoughts about who they are and what they can do and um, why they're here and, and their sense of self. And so the first part of the process of learning to live well is, um, is making some sense. What's this thing that's happened? And that involves three things. One's, one is getting a name or la naming it in some way. You know, is it something that people know about? Is it this weird and wonderful thing? What have I got? Um, there's a process of trying to work out, well, what can I do? What can't I do? Within the confines of this this experience that I'm having. And there's a, inside that it, it is a third part, which is how can I just keep the basics of life continuing? Just, you know, how do I sleep? How do I keep my partner... How do I um, manage my um, keeping my job? Just keeping it together, and then there's a process at the end of of working those things out where people get to say, "Well, if this is the way it's going to be, then I need to decide what am I going to do? Am I going to keep looking for something that that is going to fix it, or do I just get on with with it?" And the phrase that the, the people in my study used was, um, I just got on with it. Mm. And what helped them flip into that process of just getting on with it was they had um, somebody they trusted, mm. a health professional that they felt was trustworthy. Um, and that person would do little things like, um, they'd say, well, I gave you these exercises, they're specially for you. Or they rang them up in between a session to say, how, how did you get on? Or they'd um, just personalize something that was um, really meaningful for that person. Mm -hmm. And then once the person decided, if this is the way it's gonna be, then I'm just gonna get on with life. Then there were three things that they did as a part, process that I call flexibly persisting. Mm, I love that my term. <laughs> yes, we use yeah. that a lot yeah. in our teaching. It's so lovely. It's a an idea that we can't just do one thing and stick to that one strategy or that one goal or that one thing because that's not life. It doesn't work for any of us, but particularly for people who have pain. And so in that process, people were mainly motivated to, they had something that was about expressing who they are as a person. So it could be, I'm a, I'm a mum and I really want to do something for my kids. I want to be there for my children. Or um, I had people who were really sports, rugby, <laughs> go figure, <laughs> Kiwis. Um, <laughs> yeah, so rugby was the thing and I, I just 
really to me if I'm not doing that then I'm not I'm not me so they want to find that that thing that expressed who they are and then as a result of engaging or thinking yeah how can I do that then they'd start with looking at coping strategies mm -hmm. and so finding some strategies that worked and for them it was a whole bunch of things but every single person used they noticed what was happening in their body so they noticed that they had pain but it didn't have the meaning the fear the anxiety of oh this is really scary it was just I yeah this thing's going on in my body so today's a high pain day and tomorrow's a low pain day and I'll just factor that in to my calculations that was one thing mm -hmm. they all use movement um, not for becoming fitter or getting stronger or I'm going to repair my body in this way it was thinking space mm. I need to get a place where my head's free of thinking and I move and that's going to help me mm. so everybody did that and then the third thing which I I really like was anything that worked so everybody oh. gave ideas and they said look I'll try this I'll see if it fits in my life mm -hmm. I'll see if that works for me and and then evaluate what was offered to say does it fit for me if it doesn't fit for me I'll, I'll toss it um, if it's going to have too many side effects or it's going to be inconvenient mm -hmm. or it doesn't help me do what's important I'll chuck it mm -hmm. I want that so that was coping then there was a process of engaging getting back into doing what was really what ma matters what meant stuff to people so they'd just start doing it and, and actually that was that came before the coping part they'd start trying it out and they'd say oh, hold on I've hit a snag what do I know that could help me do it mm -hmm. and that meant that people were doing things that I'd been taught as a health professional weren't very good like um, one woman said that she would pay she would choose that to meet with clients in the morning because that was when she felt better and then the afternoon she would rest mm. and that's like booming and busting you can't do this really mm. bad stuff but for her she said I could choose and I guess the distinction was that she decided she'd made that decision it was right. a choice it was an act of choice and then the last part so that so the first part was I'm going to start doing the stuff I'm going to learn why do I need these strategies mm -hmm. therefore the strategies had meaning and they were reasonable and they had they helped the person do what they wanted to do and the last part was that they were starting at that point to be able to say now I can see that I could plan ahead I can think I've got a future because prior to that place when people were on that sort of making sense of all of this stuff their thoughts were just about the here and now mm -hmm. so if you ask somebody who's in the beginning stages of dealing with pain and you ask them would you like to go to a meal next week and they say I don't know what my pain's going to do. I don't know what I can do. And so what I found was them, the participants that I've worked with, that they'd gone into a point where now they could say, okay, I can plan, I can organise myself, I can decide. I'm going to on holiday away from New Zealand for, a, you know, and, and I can actually do it and plan it and it will happen. Mm -hmm. And so that was part of the being able to see that there is life beyond the managing my my health my pain right. stuff so that was the process that I found and I've listened to lots of people talking about their pain now particularly amongst the the people that we see like Gillette Belton mm -hmm. and, and others and, and Keith Meldrum and, and and folks saying that you know and they say that's that's what happened for me mm -hmm. so I kind of feel like I've found some a process mm -hmm. I've discovered a process that it, it resonates what I take from that is if we're trying to set people when they're just hit with this pain we start setting people future goals when they are just saying I don't know what this is I don't know the impact on my life and I'm just dealing with today how can we possibly expect people to set goals for six weeks down the track we, we shouldn't do that because that's not what they're focusing on they just want to know can I have my relationship with my wife right now mm -hmm. um, can I still go to work how can I get better sleep so we as 
health professionals need to contain our goal setting mm. and our projections to the here and now. But when people are at that point where they've gone beyond that, then we can say, oh, what do you really good. want to be able to do? I was going to, because I was going to challenge yeah. you, and I was going to be like, well, but we have to yeah. also, yeah. how can you plan a life? How could, there's things, yeah. You, okay, yeah. So but you, until it makes sense, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's when people have, I know what this is, I know what it means, I've worked out what I can and can't do within what I'm able to manage right now, and I'm just dealing with the everyday stuff, it's only at that point that then people are saying, well, hold on, that's stable enough that I can decide mm -hmm. to get on because if this is what it is, then this mm -hmm. is what it is. And I think sometimes when, when health professionals see somebody, they recognise how difficult it is and we want to see the person be able to see there is a life beyond there. Mm -hmm. But we overreach ourselves. We forget that it's utterly confusing to be given a name that doesn't mean anything, like fibromyalgia, what does that mean? And when I first got the sort of widespread pain diagnosis, I thought, well, am I like this forever? Um, and the participants in my study were saying, well, we are, I, there's a name for it, mm -hmm. at least it's a, a something, mm. but I don't know what that means for me. Mm. And sometimes we think that the label is sufficient but the personal impact, the the label is just a name. Mm. But the, the the impact on who I am and what matters to me has to be lived through and that. discovered. Yeah. Yeah. And then once that happens, then we can say, hold on, so this isn't what I, who I am. How can I get some more of me back? And it's in that process of what makes me me that helps people to say I you know playing rugby mm -hmm. by the way that's mm -hmm. not me <laughs> mm -hmm. playing rugby is what is me and so how can I get more of that mm -hmm. then we get the spark of um well maybe I can try this so what what do you how would you respond to when people say um you know what makes you you or what do you value what would you like to get back to and then they'll say three, four, five things, but, yeah, but I can't do those until mm -hmm. the pain is gone. Mm -hmm. And so what? how would you speak to that if someone mm -hmm. says, I, yeah, I'd rug be, I would love that, but I can't yeah. because it makes my pain worse. Yeah. So how do what would you, yeah. use, how would you speak to that? First thing I do is I check, have they been able to make sense of the stuff, making meaning? Does it make sense to you that what, the, what your pain means what your diagnosis means? Do you have a good name for it? Do you know what that means to you? Um, have you worked out what you can comfortably do right now? What's the impact? For example, if you don't know that you're safe to pick something off the floor, well, then you're going to feel really scared when you try that. So, you you know, especially if you think that that means if your back's going to break or there's something awful happening, if we can um, help you make sense of the impact what's safe and what's not mm -hmm. safe, irrespective of the of the impact on pain. And if we can help you keep right in that um, sleep, you know, your normal, mm -hmm. I can eat properly, I can do my normal daily activities, mm -hmm. those really basic things, then I would say, and what makes, so rugby makes you feel like you, what is it about? Why is rugby right. so important? Peeling back those yeah. layers like we did in the course, you yeah. guys. Pull back, yeah, so why? underlying yeah. that, underlying rugby is what is it about rugby? Oh, it's mm -hmm. it's because I'm out there with my mates. Mm -hmm. It's because it's the excitement. It's because I'm in a team and they they, they love me mm -hmm. and I well, we wouldn't use that word rugby, but <laughs> we we bond. We're mad. Yeah. We bond. <laughs> but that comrade comrade comradery. Mm -hmm. Um, then then I'd be saying, so how can you get some camaraderie? Right. In your life, what can what, what can we do to help you connect with that again? So, for one of my participants, who rugby was his thing, mm -hmm. he said, "Well, I just started to go and I watched, and I watched rugby games with my mates instead of saying I can't do it. I just don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a little bit of that back by I'm going to watch a game with my mates, mm -hmm. and we'll watch it, and we'll go to the pub and we have we'll watch it, and then I start to get involved in. He bring the 
you know, not quite the oranges at halftime, but he'd be there <laughs> to bring the, the gear yeah. and, you know, he started to get back involved with it. And then he said, well, I couldn't, I obviously couldn't do what I was doing, but I could do Masters Rugby because by the stage he was a, he's an older man. And so he started to play Masters Rugby, which means you can you can touch out of it. You mm. can play for a period of time, then you just come out of it, mm. but like touch rugby. And that was the way he found his way back. Yeah. Um, but I've had other examples with another guy who wanted to be, he decided he wanted to be a racing car driver. And so, and to do that, you have to be really fit. So he decided that he hated exercise. Mm. <laughs> and so he decided, well, I just have to start doing some exercise. So he decided, I will do that. I will go to the gym. I will start doing a little bit and I will do a normal training program until I can do that and then drive the car. Mm -hmm. Yes, my pain is going to go up, but it's worth it because I want to do this. Right. So it's like uh, um, finding out why is this thing so important? Mm -hmm. How else can we get it or how can we work, we can work towards it? Mm -hmm. um, and that's the art, I suppose, of listening to the passion underneath it. Mm -hmm. What makes you you? Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to be a great mum... You know, mums do a whole lots of things. What is it about being a mum that's so important? Well, I want to make sure my kids are, know that I'm there when they need them. So how can I do that? Mm -hmm. And there are so many different ways. ways we can yeah. be fantastic mums. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we um, cook every meal home-cooked. Yes. Sometimes we can get takeaways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I have to say I loved that part. I loved so many parts of the course, but I love that part about really finding out what's important to you, what makes mm. you you, and what is really valuable to you, and then yeah. peeling back those layers. And you kept asking why. Yeah. So but why? Um, why? You want to be a good mom. Okay, why? Well, yeah. there's maybe some obvious answers, but why? Mm. Write them down. Yeah. You want to connect. You want to raise healthy children. Okay, why is that important to you? Yeah. And then you just keep saying yeah. why. And one thing you said was, and then when you really get to the deep core of you know because you want connection and love or whatever mm. that deep core and when you say why and there's just no nothing yeah. left and say just because <laughs> just because that that That's there's it. your value and there's many yeah. different ways you can get there yeah oh wow chats all oh, words of wisdom ronnie thompson uh -huh. thank you i could an go on and pleasure. on and Thanks for watching this wow chat with Dr. Bronny Thompson. For more of Bronny's work, check out her website, the links below. And for more of my words of wisdom chats with other people that I admire and respect, please check out my playlist link below.